Good morning. I am so late. I'm so sorry. I'm so glad you're here. Um, just going to include a couple people. I know Jackie came on yesterday. Thank you, Jackie. I know um, I've seen Debbie. I know she comments. And I know Grandma Linda. I watch sometimes. We'll go with that and go on from there, okay? We are going to be in Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles. So we finished the book of First Chronicles, and now we're on to Second Chronicles. And oh, I've got this random hair sticking out. There we go. No, not much better. Okay, Second Chronicles one, and we are going to go ahead and open in prayer. Nasty. Lord, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you that we can get into your word, that you are alive and powerful, and your word affects us today just like it did 100 years ago and will continue to do for all eternity. Lord, I just thank you that you are a God that hears us and that you care about us and that we can grow and learn more about you each and every day. And I just thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 1, 3, Solomon worships at Gibeon. So Solomon, the son of David, established himself in his kingdom, and the Lord his God was with him and made him exceedingly great. And for those of you that weren't with us yesterday, um, Solomon was David's son who was going to take over the responsibility of um, building the temple. And so Solomon was the king now. Solomon spoke to all Israel, to the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, to the judges and to all the leaders in all of Israel, the heads of fathers' houses, and Solomon and all the assembly with him went to the high place that was at Gibeon. For the tent of meeting of God, which Moses the servant of the Lord had made in the wilderness, was there. So that's why David wanted to build a temple, because since the time of Moses, the Ark of the Covenant that housed the Ten Commandments, was just in a tent because the people had been in the desert wandering about, moving around, and, and they couldn't have a temple at that time. But now they had, it had been in Gibeon, and David wanted to build this temple, and God told him because he was a man of war, he couldn't build the temple, but his son Solomon could. So that's why they're all going up to Gibeon, which is where the Ark of the Covenant is in the tent. So, but David had brought up the ark of God from kirath Jerem to the place that David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it in Jerusalem. Moreover, the bronze altar that Baziel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, had made, was there before the tabernacle of the Lord. And Solomon and the assembly sought it out, and sought it, or him, 625, because I'm so late, sought him out, okay, that was in one. Oh, one, two. Oh, where is one? God answered in that night. No. Nope. And Solomon went up there. Okay. And Solomon and the assembly sought it out and sought him out. And Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tent of meeting, and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. That's dedication. He had a plan and a purpose. He is there for the long haul, right? And in that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said to God, you have shown great and steadfast love to David, my father, and have made me king in his place. Oh, Lord God, let your word to David, my father, be now fulfilled, for you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before his people before this people, for who can govern this people of yours, which is so great? And God answered Solomon, because this was in your heart, and you have not asked for possessions or wealth or honor or the life of those who hate you, and have not even asked for a long life, but have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may govern my people over whom I have made you king, wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. I also will give you riches and possessions and honors such as none of the kings who none of the kings had who were before you and none after you shall have the like. 
So Solomon came from the high place at Gibeon from before the tent of meeting to Jerusalem, and he reigned over Israel. So because Solomon asked for wisdom, and he didn't ask for stuff, or for stuff for himself for a long life, or to kill off his enemies, God blessed him with the wisdom he asked and gave him above and beyond, because that's the God we serve. We serve a God that goes above and beyond what we can even think or imagine, right? So Solomon is given wealth. Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Sorry, got out of this. Um, whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. And the king made silver as gold and gold, as common in Jerusalem as stone. The king made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stone. That's pretty common, right? And he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore of Shephelah. And Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt and Ku, and king's traders would buy them from Ku for a price. They imported a chariot from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver. How much is that? That is, a shekel is about two-fifths of an ounce. So 600 of those, 600 shekels of silver. And a horse for 150. Likewise, through them, these were exported to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria. So he is not only taking in great wealth, but he's selling the things he has as well and making great wealth as well. So preparing to build the temple. Now Solomon pur purposed to build a temple for the name of the Lord and a royal palace for himself. And there is a, oh, we can also look back if you wanted to. That is referenced in 1 Chronicles 118. Okay, now Solomon purposed to build a temple for the name of the Lord and a royal palace for himself. And Solomon assigned 70,000 men to bear burdens and 80,000 to quarry in the hill country and 3,600 to oversee them. And Solomon sent word to Hiram, the king of Tyre, as you dealt with David, my father, and sent him cedar to build himself a house to dwell in, so deal with me. Behold, I'm about to build a house for the name of the Lord my God and dedicated to him for the burning of incense of sweet spices before him and for the regular arrangement of the showbread and for burnt offerings. Morning and evening on the Sabbaths and the new moons and the appointed feasts of the Lord our God as ordained forever for Israel. The house that I'm to build will be great for our God is greater than all gods. But who is able to build him a house since heaven, even highest heaven, cannot contain him? 630. But who is able to build him a house since heaven, even highest heaven, cannot contain him? The highest heavens cannot contain God because that's how amazingly large God is, right? All right. Who am I to build a house for him except as a place to make offerings before him? So now send me a man skilled to work in gold, silver, bronze, and iron, and in purple, crimson, and blue fabrics, trained also in engraving to be with the skilled workers who are with me in Judah and Jerusalem, whom David, my father, provided. Send me also cedar, cypress, and algum timber from Lebanon, for I know that your servants know how to cut timber in Lebanon. He's a wise king. Good morning, Randy. Glad that you're here. He's a wise king, and he's complimenting, and he's giving this king honor and praise for what he has and who he is, and he's asking for those things just as he had given to his father that he was hoping that he would also give to him. And my servants will be your servants, be with your servants, to prepare timber for me in abundance, for the house I'm to build will be great and wonderful. I will give for your servants, the woodsmen who cut timber, 20,000 cores of crushed wheat, 20,000 cores of barley, 20 baths of wine, and 20 baths of oil. A core is about six bushels or 220 liters. I don't know what a bushel is, but yeah. And a bath is about six gallons. So six gallons, 20,000 times is a lot, right? and then all those bushels of wheat and barley. 
So he's not asking this king to just give him nothing, give him something for nothing. He's willing to pay for what he's asking for. Because if you're going to give unto the Lord, we're not giving things that are free to us, right? We're wanting to give things that cost us something. So then Hiram, the king of Tyre, answered in a letter that he sent to Solomon. Because the Lord loves his people, he has made you king over them. Hiram also said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who made heaven and earth, who has given King David a wise son, who has discretion and understanding, who will build a temple for the Lord and a royal palace for himself. This is the king of Tyre. This is not the king of Israel, yet he is giving Solomon honor and glory and praise, and not just Solomon, but God. So this is huge, because as we give honor and glory to God and represent him correctly, others will also give honor and glory to God when we represent God correctly. So now I have sent a skilled man who has understanding, Huram, Abba, Huram Abi, the son of a woman of the daughters of Dan. And his father was a man of Tyre. So this man is of, of two lineages, mixed nationality. He is trained to work in gold, silver, bronze, iron, stone, wood, and in purple, blue, and crimson fabrics and fine linen, and to do all sorts of engraving and execute any design that may be assigned to him. Wow. With your craftsmen, the craftsmen of my lord, David, your father. So... This man that he's sending him is a Jew and um, a man of Tyre. He is extremely talented, and he's going to work alongside David's craftsman that he set up for Solomon. And we will cut whatever timber you need from Lebanon and bring it to you in rafts by sea to Joppa so that you may take it up to Jerusalem. And then Solomon counted all the resident aliens who were in the land of Israel after the census of them that David his father had taken, and there were found 153,600. 70,000 of them he assigned to bear burdens, 80,000 to quarry in the hill country, and 3,600 as overseers to make the people work. So to make the world go round, somebody has to do the work, right? And so because these are resident aliens in the land of Israel, they are being tasked to do the work. And it's just how it is. It's not that God supports slavery or, or harsh burdens on people, but somebody's got to work and somebody's got to oversee and somebody is always over somebody, right? And so God places us all under authority and this is the authority that was given to Solomon to be able to put these people in place. So Solomon builds the temple. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David his father at the place that David had appointed on the threshing floor of Or Ornan, the Jebusite. He began to build in the second month of the fourth year of his reign, and these are Solomon's measurements for building the house of God. The lengths and cubits of the old standard was 60 cubits, and a cubit is about 18 inches. So in lengths and cubits, 60 cubits. So 18 inches times 60 is that many. And the breadth was 20 cubits. I guess we can find out. Let's see. 18 inches though, so like, yeah. I don't know, because I would have to break down inches as well, so yeah, <laughs> it's a lot. The vestibule in front of the nave of the house was 20 cubits long, equal to the width of the house, and its height was 120 cubits. He overlaid it on the inside with pure gold. The nave he lined with cypress and covered it with fine gold and made palms and chains on it. He adorned the house with settings of precious stones. The gold was gold of par parvium. So he lined the house with gold, its beams, its thresholds, its walls, and its doors, and he carved cherubim on the walls. And he made the most holy place. Its length corresponding to the breadth of the house was 20 cubits, and its breadth was 20 cubits. He overlaid it with 600 talents of fine gold, and the weight of gold for the nails was 50 shekels. And he overlaid the upper chamber chambers with gold. In the most holy place, he made two cherubim of wood and overlaid them with gold. The wings of the cherubim together extended 20 cubits. That's pretty huge because let's, so just the wings of this cherubim, I do want to do that math. Let me see. 
So it's 18 inches is a cubit times 20 cubits equals 360 inches divided by 12 is 30 feet. These wings on these cherubim, just the cherubim, are 30 feet long. 30 feet. 30 divide, so that's like 10 yards, right? 10 yards. Uh, 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 that's like on the football field, you know, like the 10 yard line. Yeah, that's huge, right? Huge. Okay, so they extended 20 cubits, one wing of the one wing of the one of five cubits touched the wall of the house, and its other wing of five cubits touched the wing on the other house. And of this cherub, one wing of the five cubits touched the wall of the house, and on the other wing also of five cubits was joined to the wing of the first cherub. The wings of these cherubim extended 20 cubits. The cherubim stood on their feet, facing the nave, and he made the veil of blue and purple and crimson fabrics and fine linen, and he worked cherubim on it. I don't know if we can even fathom how amazingly beautiful this temple would have been, but it's amazing to be able to even put together what the description is that they give us, right? So in front of the house, he made two pillars, 35 cubits high, with a capital of five cubits on each, on top of each. And he made chains like a necklace and put them on top of the pillars, and he made a hundred pomegranates and put them on the chains. He set up the pillars in front of the temple, one on the south, the other on the north, that on the south he called Jackin, and that on the north, Boaz. So this temple is being set up, and it's beautiful. And God has blessed Solomon with everything that he needs to be able to build this temple onto God, and then a palace for himself. And we're going to leave that there. That's our new that's our Old Testament reading, and now going into our New Testament reading, Romans 6 is dead to sin but alive in God. What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So we had just read yesterday that where there's much sin, there's much grace. But we're not saying we should continue to sin so we can continue to have much grace. That's not what God's saying. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? When we become Christians, we die to our old selves. We were buried, therefore, by, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Christ died for our sins and was raised to new life eternal with God that brought us into a relationship with God. And we die to our old selves and are, rise, are raised into a new life with fellowship with God, right? A new life. For we have been united with him in a death like his. We have died to our old selves. Christ died to the human man that he was on earth and was rose into his eternal body, his spiritual body, when he died. We shall certainly be united with him in resurrection like this. In his glorified body is what he rose in, and we also will have a glorified body when we join him in heaven, right? We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we no longer would be enslaved to sin. Now, our old self is referenced as the old man. The old man has been put to death. And now we have a new man living within us, right? We were who we were. And then when we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, we are who we're going to continue to be. For one who has died has been set free from sin. You are, no, you are no longer under the condemnation of sin. Jesus Christ's death on the cross, resurrection from the dead, has given you hope of heaven and eternal life immediately. It doesn't mean that you ask Jesus into your heart and then you wait to die so you can have eternal life. You ask Jesus into your heart and you begin immediately living that eternal life. And that's what we have. We have been set free from sin. Immediately where you're at, you are no longer under the bonds of sin. Does that mean you don't suffer the consequences for your sin? No. That means you do not suffer the condemnation 
for your sin because Jesus bore that condemnation on the cross. We still suffer consequences for our sin, but God. But God gives us strength, but God sees us through, but in our suffering, it produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. Hope that does not disappoint, right? So now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We believe that. That's our, that's our hope. That's our future. That's what doesn't disappoint, is that we will live with Christ Jesus, right? We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Jesus Christ will never die again. He died once and once for all mankind, right? Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. For the lives he, but for the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We are no longer alive in the sin that we were in, but we are now alive. In Christ Jesus, we are dead to who we were, and we are alive in who we are in Christ Jesus. Let no sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. We have the power. Do you see that? Let no sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body. We have to let it reign. We have to allow that sin to reign in our body. We have the control to be able to allow it or to reject it. And if we stand firm in Christ Jesus, we have the power to be able to put off that sin that's in our lives. Now, we're not talking about people that have any kind of psychiatric issues that maybe are in need of medication. We're not talking about sin that because those things are not sin, correct? They are, they are medical needs. People sometimes believe, well, if you have enough faith, you won't have fear or anxiety. You know, if you have enough faith, you won't have, you, you can conquer those, those, um, those problems you have in your mind. Well, I'm hoping people are, are gaining enough knowledge these days to understand that psychiatric issues are the same as physical heart issues or liver or kidney issues, they're all the same. They're all medical issues in need of medical attention. Those are not sin that need to be overcome. And when we put that burden on someone that is trying to deal with that in their lives, we just are putting down our own, our own brothers, right, and sisters in Christ. So do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Our members are us. We are the members, right? Our hands, our feet, our minds, our hearts, our bodies, those are the members of God. Are we presenting ourselves, our bodies, who we are, as unto unrighteousness or unto righteousness? It's your choice to present yourself whichever direction you are, but you can't do both right? You, you can only go down one road. You, you can't go down two roads. You have to make a choice. And when we make that choice for God, we can't also try to walk down the road of sin as well, right? So for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Not saying that we are not to obey the laws, right? Being under the law was being under the Ten Commandments. And under the Ten Commandments, they were only in place to show us our sin. The Ten Commandments are set up to show us where we fail, where we fall short, because you cannot keep the Ten Commandments at all times. We all fail. We all fall short. We have all sinned. We are no longer under the Ten Commandments, but we are under grace. And under grace, we have forgiveness. We have hope. We have a future, right? So... Slaves to righteousness, and that word has not so positive connotation in this day and age. Nobody wants to be a slave to anything. Slavery was bad and has been abolished. We don't like human trafficking. We don't like it at all when anybody is forced to do anything. But this slavery is different. Let's read on. Verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? 
by no means. Just because we are not under the Ten Commandments, under, but under grace, doesn't mean that we should keep sinning. By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, and the other reference is a bond servant. Now, a bond servant was someone that willingly served and took up that bond and allowed that bond to be paid through his service. He took up a bond with his master and he served him as a bond servant. That person was free to leave if he wanted to, but as a bond servant, he had a bond to his master to serve him all the days of his life. So are we, as obedient slaves or bond servants, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. We have to make a choice. We are not slaves without a choice. God is not about forcing anybody to do anything. But when you come to Jesus Christ and you want a personal relationship with God, you have to make a choice. What road are you going to follow? What path are you going to be on? Are you going to be a slave or a bondservant to sin and death? Or are you going to be a slave or a bondservant to righteousness and God and serving him and doing what is right? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. It has to be a heart issue. It has to be your heart willingly wanting to serve God. It can't be under duress and it can't be forced and it can't be something that you're doing begrudgingly. Your whole heart has to be in it in service to God, right? I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So we followed impurity and lawlessness. Without God, there is impurity. So we have wrong thoughts, wrong motives, wrong actions, and lawlessness disregard for the law, disregard for authority, disregard for other people over ourselves, which leads to more impure thoughts and more lawlessness. So then if we are going to reject that and put that old man to death, then we need to go on to our new man, which is what? Oh, I'm back. Let me see. Where did it just, oh, sorry, I missed up. Um, so are we going to go forward as slaves of righteousness? As slaves of righteousness, we're doing what is right. We're following after God. We're having pure thoughts that are focused on God, that are on what is true and right and holy and just. And we're not under lawlessness. We're not following lawlessness, but to follow the law, which means that we are willingly wanting to keep the Ten Commandments, right? Does that mean that if we fall short and fail, that we no longer are in relationship with God? No. Because in God there is forgiveness and there is grace, right? So when we follow after righteousness, it leads to sanctification. Sanctification is a lifelong process. We talked about justification yesterday. When you ask Jesus Christ into your life and you begin a personal relationship with him, you are justified. It is just as if you never sinned. But sanctification is a daily just like what we're doing right now, daily in the Word, daily in prayer, daily seeking after God, daily following after Him, daily sharing His Word with other people, daily doing what He's called you to do, living out His purpose, sharing His Word, sharing the good news. That is sanctification. It is sanctifying you, setting you apart from the lawlessness that's around you and the impurity that's around you, sanctifying you for a special and holy purpose. To follow after God, right? So verse 20, for when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. The end of sin is death. Sin is separation from God. Sin is not blessed by God. Sin is you making yourself the idol in your life. And there's no fruit from that. There's only death from that. From the beginning in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve took of the forbidden fruit, that sin 
caused us to have separation from God. And the only way to have reconciliation to God is for us to come back to him, right? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin, we are free from the condemnation of sin. We are free from having to follow after our sinful nature and have become slaves to God, bond servants to God, willingly following after God. So the word slave is what they put here, but like we said before, bond servant is a better description because a bond servant willingly is bonded to his master to serve him all the days of his life. It is a willing service, and that's what we are to be. The fruit you get leads to sanctification, setting apart for a holy purpose, and its end is eternal life. Your end is eternal life, and the eternal life is not when you die. The eternal life is when you first believe, and you begin to live that eternal life here on earth. And I think that's a thing that we miss as Christians is that you're living your eternal life now. Our eternal life is, is now and immediate. God doesn't say, and you will have eternal life. Having eternal life is the gift that you have immediately. You immediately start to live in that eternal life because you have died once to death, to the sin that you were in. You will not die a second time in the second death. To be absent from this body is to be present with God. When we die here as a Christian, as someone that is saved in a relationship with God, we are absent here from this body and we are present with God. It's immediate. There is no, it's a crossover from death to life, right? So for the wages of sin is death. You are, you are working towards death. If you are living for sin, your wages, your payment, your, what you're owed and due is death. But the free gift of God, it's free. Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose again, so you can have this free gift that is sitting here before you, and all you have to do is take it. That is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That eternal life is for you, it's for me, it is for us to take freely. We can't earn it, deserve it, or buy it. All we have to do is take it, and God gives it to us freely, but we have to receive it. Okay, I know that's a lot, and if anybody has questions on that, please feel free to comment or um, ask whatever the questions would be. So we're going to go into our Psalm 16 reading. You will not abandon my soul. And again, this is a mictum. mictum. A mictum is probably a musical or liturgical term of David. So this is a Psalm of David. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. You are all that I need. You are all that I want. There is nothing good except in God, right? For the saint, As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. And that is transferred into the saints in the land, the excellent in whom is all my delight. I say... What does he say? The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. When we are following after idols such as our own self and our own pleasure and our own careers and our own families and our everything that has to do with I and me and us, you multiply sorrow. You will find that you are never satisfied, you are never happy, you are never fulfilled. They drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. They are drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. God will not accept their offerings. You may think that even though I follow after these things and, and those things are the most important things in my life, I still, I still love God, I still follow Him, I still do what He wants. But, but God is not going to accept your offering. God does not speak your name because you are not following after God. So God is not going to accept your offerings. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. Is God your chosen portion? What's a chosen portion? Well, you get a plate of steak and it's being served to the family. And you know what? Guess what? There is that chosen portion that's your dad's piece of steak you know that one's going to dad 
That's the choice portion, right? Well, that choice portion is God's. He is your cup. He is your fulfillment, right? He holds your lot, meaning that he holds control over you. He holds everything that's going to happen to you goes through God. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. David is saying his the lines, meaning what has happened to him. Like we have... Um, Boundaries are things that go on around us, right? And those we can call the lines that are surrounding us, right? Like the lines, the property lines on a house. My lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. David did not have an easy time. David was constantly a man of war. He was either fleeing from Saul or fleeing from Absalom or in a war or suffering the consequences of his own sin. And he's saying the lines have fallen in pleasant places. How can he say that? Because he's seen things through the eyes of God, right? I have a beautiful inheritance. This is not my home. My inheritance is in heaven. So I can trust and know that even though this is going on now, God's got this. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken because God is at your right hand. You shall not be shaken. Does that mean you will not go through trials and troubles and suffering? No, it means he is at your right hand and you won't be shaken through those things. Those things are going to happen, period, point blank. You're not going to get away from them. But God is there, and he is at your right hand, and he is there to protect you and guide you and help you through those situations. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also, also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or hell, or eternal separation from God, or let your Holy One see corruption, meaning that they would be separated and there would be death and eternity without God, right? You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In God's presence, there's fullness of joy, even though in the midst of suffering and turmoil and anguish. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. At God's right hand are pleasures forevermore. And what else? Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Pleasures forevermore and God are at the right hand, right? He is at my right hand. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. At God's right hand are pleasures forevermore. He is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. At my right hand is the Lord God. I don't have to be moved. And at God's right hand is all the pleasures forevermore. He is there. He is with us. He is protecting us and he gives us pleasures forevermore. Now, when that word comes up, maybe it's things that are not of God. That is not a pleasure that is in line with what God is, right? So make sure that your pleasures are in line with the pleasures of God. And the pleasures of God would be anything that is true and noble and righteous and holy. Those things are the pleasures of God, right? Okay. So going on, that's the end of our Psalms reading for today, and it is now 7 o'clock. Um, we're finishing up with our Proverbs reading, Proverbs 19, 20 through 21. Listen to advice and accept instruction. This is the hardest thing for me to accept from my husband. You know, I could listen to advice and accept instruction from pretty much anybody else. When my husband gives me advice or instruction, I take it as an offense every single time. It is not his fault. He is so sweet and kind and patient. I always take it as an offense and I always have to go back and apologize and rework it in my mind and mull it over. And I know it goes back to the curse where we have to respect our husbands that he, they will be our authority from the book of Genesis when Eve sinned and God said that your husband would rule over you. Yeah. That is, that is that eternal curse in my head because I can take advice and instruction from anybody but my husband. And I don't know about you, that's my, that's my shortcoming. That you may gain wisdom in the future. That's what I want. I want wisdom in the future, but I hate to get it from my husband. And it's so wrong. And I'm being honest. Let's just be real. I'm, I fail. I fall short. Nobody's on a pedestal here. I'm being truthful. Many are the plans in the mind of a man. But it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. 
I don't know about you, but I, I am a planner. I'm an organizer. I like to look ahead. I see something here and I see where it will end up a year from now. And I want to do all the steps in place to get there. But the purpose of the Lord is what will stand. And there have been times that I set up plans in, in line and the purpose of the Lord is comes along and those plans fall by the wayside. Why? Because his plan is going to stand. Now, what do I do in the meantime? When his plan stands and my plan fails, do I throw a fit and decide I'm not going to fall after God? I have a fit sometimes. Let's be honest. Sometimes I'm not okay with God's plan. But for the most part, as I'm continually in the Word and continually in prayer, I do see God's hand in it and I come around quite quickly or I don't fall off at all. So I give that to you and I'm trying to be honest because we all fall short and fail. And just because we're Christians and just because we're saved, good morning, Phoebe, doesn't mean that we're perfect. And so God has a plan and a purpose for you that is far greater than you could possibly imagine. And he wants you to live a life that is in line with him and that is um, what he's called you to be. And I hope that as you continue to get into his word, that you will find that a blessing in your life. And um, have an excellent weekend. I look forward to seeing you guys on Monday. And um, We'll talk later. Thanks so much.